Good afternoon. So, in the last session we have studied about self induction we have seen. Now, <coughs> so we define self induction as the phenomena by which an EMF is induced in a coil due to the flux created by the changing current flowing through the same coil is known as self induction. So, whenever the current changes in the same coil then the flux linking with it changes thereby an EMF induced in the coil is going to be induced and it is going to change that is known as self induction. <coughs> and we also defined self induced EMF. The EMF induced in the coil due to the changing flux created by the current flowing through the same coil is called as self induced EMF and it is measured in volts and it is given by the equation E L equals minus N D phi by D T. The minus sign shows that the EMF induced is always in opposition to the applied voltage. So, today we will study about mutual induction. <coughs> so, here you can observe in this figure there are two coils placed neighboring to each other that is they are placed close to each other. You can observe the coil there this is one coil and this is another coil. A current flows in the first coil you can observe the coil is connected through a rheostat to a supply. So, because this is a closed circuit a current flows through the coil and because the current is flowing through the coil it sets up magnetic field around itself. You can observe that these are the magnetic lines of force or the flux. Now, some of this flux is seen linking with the neighboring coil. Likewise, the vice versa can also be true that is you can make the current to flow in the second coil by making this arrangement. You can observe here the second coil is been connected to the supply and it is a closed circuit therefore, a current flows through the second coil and the flux produced is going to be linking with the first coil. Okay. Now, what do we understand by this? So, this here you can observe that the flux <coughs> changing flux in the first coil sets up an induced EMF in the second coil. Now, this phenomena by which an EMF is induced in a coil due to the flux created by the changing current flowing through the neighboring coil is known as mutual induction. So, what do we understand? It is a phenomena by which an EMF is induced in a coil due to the flux created by the changing current flowing through the neighboring coil is known as mutual induction. So, here you can observe there are two coils which are placed near to each other. So, in the first coil if we call it as the primary coil you can see it is connected to a battery through a rheostat and because it is a closed circuit a current flows through the uh, coil and it sets up magnetic lines of force you can see this this is the magnetic lines of force or the flux. Now, some of this flux links with the second coil or it is also known as the secondary coil and because of this an EMF is going to be induced in the secondary coil which can be noticed by the deflection in the pointer of the galvanometer we have already conducted this experiment. Okay. 
it obeys Faraday's laws. So, you can observe a deflection in the pointer of the galvanometer. <coughs> now, this is the concept of mutually induced EMF. So, when the two coils are placed close by, whenever a current flowing through the first coil changes, whenever current flowing through the first coil changes, the magnitude of the flux set up by the coil is going to change. That means, there is a change in the magnitude of the flux that is being set up. Some of this flux is linking with the second coil. You can observe here, the flux is linking with the second coil. Now, this flux is known as the mutual flux. It is known as mutual flux. Now, if we change the value of current, then the flux will change and hence according to Faraday's law, an EMF will be induced in the second coil. So, if we change the magnitude of the current that is flowing through the coil 1, then there is a change in the magnitude of the flux that is being produced, thereby the flux linking with the second coil is going to change and therefore, an EMF is induced as per Faraday's law. So, <coughs> now this induced EMF, this induced EMF due to changing flux created by the current flowing in the neighboring coil is known as mutually induced EMF. This is known as mutually induced EMF because there are two coils, neighboring coils. Because of the current changing in one coil, an EMF is being induced in the other coil and this induced EMF is called as mutually induced EMF. It is measured in volts and it is given by this expression EM equals N2 D51 by DT volts, where D51 by DT shows the rate of change of flux in the first coil. The subscript 1 here denotes that there is a rate of change of flux in the first coil which is linking with the number of turns in the second coil N2 represents the number of turns on the second coil. So, d 51 by d t that means, the rate of change of flux in the first coil into the number of turns in the second coil. This gives the total flux linkages, total flux linkages. <coughs> so, the product of these two gives E m that is the mutually induced E m f. Next, we will understand the definition of self-inductance. Now, self-inductance of a coil is the property of that coil by virtue of which it opposes any change in the current flowing through that coil. So, the coil is made up of some material and whenever current tries to flow through that material, it tries to oppose the any change in the current that is flowing through that coil and that property of the coil is known as self inductance which is represented by L and it is measured in terms of coefficient of self induction. Now, let us define what is coefficient of self induction which is represented as L. Now, it is defined as it is defined as the number of Weber turns created in that coil for every ampere of current flowing through that coil. So, what do we understand? It is the number of Weber turns, it is the number of Weber turns created in that coil for every ampere of current that is flowing through that coil and it is measured, it is measured in Henry's 
and it is given by the equation L equals N phi by I where N phi shows the <coughs> product it is N is the number of turns phi is the flux which is expressed in Weber's. So, this is Weber turns N phi is Weber turns for every ampere of current I stands for current. So, L is the coefficient of self induction which is given by N phi by I. Now, these are some of the formulas which are governing <coughs> the self inductance. We have already learned that L is equal to N phi by I and the unit is in Henry's. The unit is in Henry's. Now, you observe here L equals we can write the equation as N by I into phi. The same equation as in 1 can be written as N by I into phi. We know that the flux is given by another equation as N I by R where R stands for the reluctance. R stands for reluctance. Further, we can write this as N by I can be retained, N I is retained and you can substitute the formula for reluctance, reluctance as L by A mu naught into mu R. So, when this moves to the numerator, then the equation becomes A mu naught mu r into n squared by L Henry's. So, this is another equation for self coefficient of self inductance. So, it is also given by L equals A mu naught mu r n squared by L and the unit is in Henry's. Now, we have one more equation which can be written like this. Now, take this equation the second equation L equals N by I into phi. So, just cross multiply here. So, this becomes L into I, L into I equals N phi. It becomes L into I equals N phi. Now, differentiating on both sides, on both sides with respect to time, we get the equation as N d phi by d t equals L d i by d t. So, what we can do? We can differentiate on both sides of this equation. L i by phi we can <coughs> differentiate on both sides. So, we get n into d phi by d t equals L into d i by d t that is differentiating on both sides with respect to time. This is the equation, but we know that n d phi by d t is nothing but the self induced emf represented as e l. Self induced emf which is represented as e l therefore, e l is equal to l d i by d t and this is expressed in volts. It is an induced emf. So, it is expressed in volts. So, these are the formulas which are governing the self inductance coefficient of self inductance. <coughs> so, in the given problems you have to study what is the given data and based on that you have to use the formulae and solve the problem. Next we will move on to mutual inductance which is represented as M. Mutual induct now let us define what is this mutual inductance. Just now we have understood what is mutual induction. So, what is mutual induction? It is nothing but whenever two coils are placed close by and when the current in one coil is changing, it induces an EMF in the other coil that is mutual induction. That is the phenomena is mutual induction. Now, let us define mutual induction. Okay. Mutual inductance between any two coils placed nearby is 
the ability of one coil to produce an EMF in the other coil when the current in the first coil changes at the rate of 1 ampere per second. So, two coils are placed side by side. So, whenever the current in the first coil changes, it induces an EMF in the second coil. Now, at the rate of 1 ampere per second, then it is called as mutual inductance. Now, this is expressed in terms of coefficient of mutual induction. So, let us define the coefficient of mutual induction represented by M. Coefficient of mutual induction between any two coils placed nearby is defined as the number of Weber turns produced in one coil due to 1 ampere of current flowing through the other coil. So, in one coil what is the if 1 ampere of current is flowing through one coil then the number of Weber turns produced in the other coil gives coefficient of mutual induction. It is denoted by M and it is measured in Henry's. So, the equation for this is given by M equals phi 1 n 2 by i 1, phi 1 n 2 by i 1. From this equation, we can understand that phi 1 is the flux produced in the first coil when a current of i 1 is flowing through the first coil and that flux is linking with n 2 that means the number of turns in the second coil. So, here if the equation is written like this, it shows that the current is flowing in the first coil, thereby a flux is being set up in the first coil which is linking with the turns of the second coil and it is expressed in Henry's. The equation can also be written as N1 by I2, N1 phi 2 by I2 n 1 phi 2 by i 2. Now, from this expression what do we understand? We can understand that now it is vice versa, it has changed like the current is flowing in the second coil. See i 2 is the current flowing in the second coil because of which phi 2 is the flux set up in the second coil. You can observe here phi 2 is the flux set up in the second coil. Now, this flux is linking with the turns of the first coil. It is linking with the turns of the first coil. So, either ways we can write the equation depending upon in which coil the current is flowing and the unit of mutual induction uh, coefficient of mutual induction is Henry's. Now, these are the formulas which are governing the uh, <coughs> mutual inductance or coefficient of mutual induction. So, just now we discussed the first uh, equations. So, the second one you can observe here m equals n 2 phi 1 by i 1. Okay? Any one equation you can pick either the first one or the second one. <coughs> so, here when you take this n 2 phi 1 by i 1 we can write this as n 2 by i 1 into phi 1 and we can substitute for phi 1 the equation n 1 i 1 by r where r is the reluctance of the magnetic circuit. So, again for r we can substitute r is equal to L by A mu naught mu r. So, when we do that substitution finally, we get this equation n 1 n 2 into mu naught mu r into A by L. Now, another equation for this is m equals n 2 phi 1 by i 1 again cross multiply here. So, it becomes m into i 1 equals 
n2 into phi 1. So, just cross multiply. Now, differentiating on both sides with respect to time, we are going to get n2 into d phi 1 by dt equals m into di 1 by dt. So, so, here by this n2 into d phi 1 by dt gives what em mutually induced emf. So, just now we have studied the equation for mutually induced emf. So, em is equal to m di 1 by dt. So, mutual inductance in coefficient of mutual inductance into rate of change of current. So, it is expressed in volts. So, here let us solve a simple problem here. Now, <coughs> this is the let us take a simple problem here. Okay. So, here you can read the problem here as a coil of 100 turns is linked is linked with 0 0.005 Webers that is 5 into 10 raised to minus 3 Webers when carrying a current of 10 amperes. If the current is uniformly reversed in 0 0.05 seconds, find the EMF induced in the coil. So, now this is the given problem then what is the data given? First analyze what is the data given. So, what is given here? One is a coil of 100 turns. So, that means n is given n equals 100 turns. Then flux is given. The flux linked here is 0.005 Webers is given. Then current is given which is 10 amperes and time is given that is 0 0.05 seconds. Now, we are supposed to find out the EMF induced in the coil, find the EMF induced in the coil. Now, with the given data, first we can find out the inductance of the coil. First, we have to find out inductance of the coil which is given by L equals N phi by I. So, L is equal to Okay. So, you can observe here. So, it is given by L equals N phi by I that is you substitute the values N we know, phi we know and the current we know. So, substituting and solving we are going to get the value as 2 Henry's. Sorry, here. Okay. So, this was not ok. So, we are going to get this as 0 0.05 Henry's. Now, what is the induced EMF here? That is given by the equation E L equals L di by d t volts. So, substitute here L is 0 0.05 just now we have found out d i by d t that means what rate of change of current di by dt is rate of change of current. Now, you can observe in the given problem that the current is changing. He says that the current is uniformly reversed. It says that the current is uniformly reversed. So, that is if the current was flowing in a particular direction, the same current has been reversed. Okay. So, here for rate of change of current, you will have to substitute as 10 minus of minus 10 divided by the time that is given. So, solving this we are going to get 20 volts. Now, this is another uh, problem here we can just go through this uh, problem. A current of 5 amps flowing through a coil of 500 turns produces a flux of 20 milli Weber 
find the coefficient of self induction and the inductive reactance of the coil at 50 hertz frequency. So, first analyze what is the given data n is given that is 500 flux is given 20 millivebers current 5 amperes and frequency is given here which is 50 hertz. Now, we have to calculate the inductance of the coil L is equal to n phi by i. So, substitute the given values we are going to get 2 Henry's and here we are asked to find out the inductive reactance. The equation for inductive reactance is given by x L equals 2 pi f L and it is expressed in ohms. 2 pi f L it is expressed in ohms. Pi value is 3.141. So, substitute the values we know 2 is a constant pi value into frequency it is given 50 hertz into L that is inductance just now we have found out it is 2 and substituting we are going to get the value as 628.2 ohms. So, here you can observe okay. So, here there are two more problems which are written on the board you can just go through that problem there two coils each of 800 turns are placed close to each other. If a current of 5 amps flowing through the first coil produces a flux of 0.02 Weber's find the mutual inductance between the two coils assuming there is no leakage. So, what all the data that is given N 1 is given he is telling two coils each of 800 turns. So, each of 800 turns mean, meaning to say what it is there are two coils here each of 800 turns that is you can observe N 1 is 800, N 2 is also 800. Then if a current of 5 amperes, so you can observe I 1 is given as 5 amperes and the flux here is given as <coughs> 0 0.02 Weber's, it is given as 0 0.02 Weber's. Now, he has asked you to find the mutual inductance between the two coils. Mutual inductance is given by this equation N2 into phi 1 by I1 because current is flowing through the first coil. So, I will be writing the equation as N2 into phi 1 by I1. N2 is 800, phi 1 he has given here it is 0 0.02 Weber's. So, write that. I 1 is 5 amps. So, we are going to get 3.2 Henry's. Next we will move on to another problem here. Two coils of 500 turns each and coefficient of mutual inductance being m equals 2 Henry are placed close to each other. If the current in the first coil changes from 10 amps to 5 amps in 0 0.2 seconds find mutually induced EMF. So, this is the given problem. So, analyze the problem. What is the given data? Two coils, okay. Two coils 500 turns each he is telling. That means to say both the coils are having 500 turns. So, therefore, N1 is equal to 500, N2 is also equal to 500. Then, Mutual inductance he is given as 2 Henry. Current he is telling changes from 10 amps to 5 amps. That means first I1 was 10 amps, then I2 that, that is the change value of current is 5 amps and time is 0 0.2 seconds. Then mutually induced EMF is given by EM equals M d i 1 by d t. We have learned this equation. So, m d i 1 by d t. So, m why I wrote d i 1 because he is telling that the current in the first coil changes. 
Suppose you are told in the second coil, then you have to write the equation as m d i 2 by d t. Now, because he is telling in the first coil, I will write the equation as m d i 1 by d t. So, substitute m is 2 d i 1 by d t that is rate of change of current, rate of change of current, current is changing, it is changing from 10 to 5. So, 10 minus 5 divided by the current that is 0 0.2 and solving this we are going to get 50 volts and because it is induced EMF the unit of induced EMF is going to be 50 volts. So, like this you can solve a number of numericals by changing the values given in the sample problems. You can change the numericals there and solve a number of problems uh, that gives you a good practice. Okay. Okay. Yes, no, I have to continue. Next. Okay. So, next we will start with the next chapter DC generators. <coughs> so, we have learnt about Faraday's laws, the first law, the second law then the self induced EMF, mutually induced EMF and now let us move on to DC generators. Now, what is a generator? Now, generator is an electrical machine which converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. This energy conversion is based on the principle of production of dynamically induced EMF. <coughs> so, here is a simple figure which shows the input is mechanical energy to a generator and the output that we are going to get is electrical energy. Now, this is the figure of a practical generator. You can observe the different parts of the DC generator. So, here are the field poles this is the yoke, the armature winding, this is the yoke and the shaft and this is the commutator. Coming to a simpler diagram which is going to show the constructional details of a DC generator. So, here the center one is the shaft and this bar what you can see the circular bars segmented bars that you can see is the commutator and placed on the commutator is the brushes and these stampings with slots cut in them is the armature core and inside the slots the armature conductors are placed and covering all the core we have the outermost covering that is the yoke and here is the pole core on which the field coil is wound and this is the pole shoe, pole shoe and this is the eye bolt and this is the legs of the DC generator. Now, this is just a view of a DC generator. So, whatever has been told you can observe here, this is the central shaft, this is the commutator, this is the coil that is the conductors which are placed in this uh, slot. You can see a narrow opening here that is the slot in which the conductors are to be are going to be placed. This is the field magnet. You can see this here 1, 2, uh, 
3 and 4. This is a 4 pole uh, generator that has been shown. So, this is the field magnet. Now, coming to the principle of operation of a DC generator. So, we have understood that DC generator is a machine which converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. It works on the principle of Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction. Now, what does it say? Whenever the conductor moves in a magnetic field in such a way that the conductor cuts across the magnetic lines of flux, an EMF is induced in the conductor. The magnitude of the induced EMF is equal to the rate of change of flux linking with the conductor. So, this is the Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction. Just recall the Faraday's uh, laws of electromagnetic induction, the first law as well as the second law. So, here <coughs> it works on the principle of Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction. Now, this induced EMF causes a current to flow in the conductor circuit if the circuit is closed. So, we will just recall what is the Faraday's law stay. The first law says that whenever the magnetic flux linked with the conductor changes, an EMF is induced in it. And the second law states that the magnitude of the induced EMF is equal to the rate of change of flux linkages. So, here you can observe in this uh, figure a changing magnetic flux through a loop or loop of wires induces an electromotive force voltage in each loop. You can just observe that through the coil whenever the magnetic field is being moved, it is being moved. We have already demonstrated this uh, experiment that is if you are going to keep the bar magnet stationary, then there is no deflection in the galvanometer. But whenever there is a movement in the bar magnet, the magnetic lines of force that is the flux is going to be cut, therefore an EMF is going to be induced. And again observe the pointer movement of the galvanometer. When the magnet is moved towards the coil, the deflection is in one direction and when it moves away from the coil, it is in the another direction. This is nothing but dynamically induced EMF. We have studied about this. This is dynamically induced EMF. Then how to find out the direction of this dynamically induced EMF by applying Fleming's right hand rule. So, the Fleming's right hand rule states that whenever the first three fingers of your right hand are stretched mutually perpendicular to each other, the thumb the first finger, middle finger, all of them are stretched mutually perpendicular to each other. Then if the first finger points in the direction of the field, the thumb points in the direction of motion of the conductor, then the middle finger gives the direction of the current. So, the same Fleming's right hand rule can be applied to a conductor which is moving in the air gap between two permanent magnets. So, here you can apply. Now, therefore, what are the basic requirements that is to be satisfied for generation of EMF? One is we require a uniform magnetic field, then we require a system of conductors that means a number of conductors we require and third is relative motion between the magnetic field and the conductors because we have already discussed about dynamically induced EMF. So, what does it say? Either the magnetic field has to move or the coil has to move. In all there must be a relative motion between the conductor and the magnetic field then an EMF is going to be induced. <coughs> Now, this is a simple loop generator. So, you can observe in the air gap 
the conductor is rotating in the air gap. So, by rotating in the air gap, it is going to cut the magnetic lines of force. Therefore, an EMF is going to be induced and if the circuit is closed, a current flows through the circuit. Now, we will study what is the basic operation of the generators. Now, as the loop rotates, so you can observe here, these two are the pole pieces of a permanent magnet. In the air gap between the, uh, in the air gap, we are going to place the coil or the loop of the coil and the coil, one end of the coil is connected to the slip rings. You can observe these brown rings that is one end of the coil is connected to slip ring, the other end is also connected to another slip ring and brushes are present on the slip rings which through which current moves on to the external circuit. So, the basic operation here is as the loop rotates, the magnetic flux through it changes with time. This induces an EMF and a current in the external circuit. The ends of the loop are connected to slip rings that rotate with the loop. Connections to the external circuit are made by stationary brushes in contact with the slip rings. So, here you can understand that these slip rings are moving along with the loop of the coil which is moving in the air gap, which is rotating in the air gap. Okay? and the brushes are stationary, but the brushes are stationary and the brushes convey the current to the external circuit. Now, let us study the parts of the DC generator. So, these are the parts of the DC generator. It has a yoke, a rotor, rotor is the rotating part, then stator, it is the stationary part of the uh, generator pole core and pole shoes, then it has the armature which is made up of armature conductors and armature winding, then we have the commutator and of course, the bearings. Okay. Now, this is the yoke. Now, yoke is the outermost covering of the machine, of the DC machine. You can just see it is usually made up of cast iron. It is the outermost covering of the machine. It acts as a protective frame for the internal parts of the machine. <coughs> and this is the, this is the, this is the pole shoe, solid uh, pole core and this is the laminated pole shoe. So, here you can observe in the coal, there is the lifting eye, this is the terminal box where the connections are given, this is the frame and this is the feet of the yoke. Now, what are the functions of this yoke? So, mainly it acts as a support, mechanical support, then it offers a low reluctance path for the magnetic flux. It offers a low reluctance path for the magnetic flux. It is made up of high permeable, permeable material. So, for small machines, usually cast iron is used because of the low cost and for large machines, it is made up of cast steel or rolled steel is used for the construction of yoke. Next is pole cores and pole shoes. Pole core is, it carries the field coils, rectangular cross sections of are laminated to reduce heat losses and it is fitted to the yoke through bolts. And pole shoes, it acts as a support to the field coils and it spreads out the flux. So, you can observe here, this is the pole shoe, this is the, sorry, this is the pole, uh, this is the pole core body and here what you see in a semi-circular uh, uh, cross section here, that is the pole shoe. And you can see that it is laminated, a number of laminations and these are rivets or bolts are fitted through these stampings, through a number of such uh, stampings are connected and it is bolted. It is not made up of one solid material because in order to reduce the hysteresis and the eddy current losses, it is laminated. It is nothing but like uh, uh, we have a number of pages in a book which is bound together. 
like this a number of thin sheets of the uh, pole material cut out in this cross section what you can see here are connected together put together and it is bolted together and this uh, shape is given to the pole shoes in order to uh, spread out the flux because it is a circular machine in order to spread out the flux the circular shape is given. So, this you can observe here a number of stampings this bolts here the top two bolts are used to bolt it to the yoke you can observe here this is the yoke that is the outermost covering of the machine and this pole shoe and the pole core is bolted or connected to the yoke via this bolt. And here you can see this number of stampings are uh, riveted together through this rivet holes and uh, that is uh, bolts are put through this rivet holes and this constitutes the pole shoe. So, now you can understand the overall picture or construction of this DC generator. So, here is the yoke that you can see this is the central shaft and here we have the commutator and the brushes and this in the slots what you can see here the armature conductors are placed and here what you see is the field winding this is the feet of the yoke on which the machine stands. Again the armature is not a, is not made up of one solid material. A number of such stampings what you can see here a number of thin stampings like this you can see there is a slot here this the depth what you see here is called the slot and this projections what you see is called as the teeth ok. And this is the keyway which is used to fit these stampings to the shaft and air holes here you can see small air holes. Now, these air holes or ducts are provided for circulation of air for cooling purpose. Now, when number of such stampings are put together this is how it is seen you can see here a number of such stampings have been put together and it is going to be bolted together and continuously in this slot you can see the slot here the armature conductors are going to be placed armature conductor is going to be placed in the slot. Next we have the commutator which is made up of hard drawn copper bar segments insulated from each other by mica segments this mica segments act as the insulation. Now this act as a means between the armature and the external circuit. Now, whatever current is produced in the armature that has to be transferred to the external circuit and that is done via or through this commutator. So, the commutator acts as a link for transferring current that is generated by the machine to the external circuit. <coughs> so, this is the construction of a commutator. So, here you can see this what you can see here is the commutator this is the commutator uh, segments and here what you see is the brush a spring, a spring is provided for springing action because commutator is continuously rotating along with the uh, <coughs> loop of the you have you just now saw the simple loop uh, generator. So, here what happens the brush but the brushes are stationary on that. So, even though the commutator is rotating the brushes are stationary and that picks up the current and passes it on to the external circuit. So, bearings and the brushes. Now, brushes are usually made up of carbon graphite or copper brushes are used and the function of the brush is to collect current from the commutator. So, it collects current from the commutator and supplies it to the external circuit. Shaft is the mechanical link between the prime mover and the armature and bearings are used for free rotation. So, you can observe here this is a bearing, this is a brush holder 
you can observe these are carbon brushes here a uh, springing action by which you can uh, tension adjusting handle this is the brush box so you can adjust the tension of by placing uh, that the, it is springing action for the brushes when it is moving on the commutator but the brush is stationary now armature winding is of two types one is it is lap winding another is wave winding so this is how the armature winding is going to be you can observe here in this this is the commutator you can see this is rotating the commutator these two are the brushes which are placed on the commutator and the brushes are connected to the external circuit and these you can see is the armature conductors these are the armature conductors this is the stator the field here so in dc generator what do we observe the field is stationary the conductor is moving so it is dynamically induced emf here how is it the field is stationary the field you can see the north pole the south pole the field is stationary whereas the conductor is continuously rotating in the air gap in the field next coming to the types of dc generators now dc generators may be classified as separately excited dc generators self excited dc generators under self excited dc generator we have further shunt generator series generator and compound generator compound generator can be further classified as cumulative compound generator and differential compound generator so this is a picture here of the whatever the classification we studied this is a dc generator one is self excited and another is separately excited self excited we have three types shunt generator series generator and compound generator and again under compound generator we have com cumulative compound differential compound and again under cumulative compound we have long shunt short shunt and likewise under differential also we have long shunt short shunt so this is the connections how it is made in the dc generators okay now let us study what is separately excited dc generator in a separately excited dc generator the field coil is energized or excited from a separate voltage source in order to produce flux in the machine so you can observe here this is the armature this is the field coil the field coil is separately excited you can see the voltage source here through a rheostat it is supplied to the field coil and it is separate from the armature and the armature is connected to the load so that is why it is called as separately excited that is there is the field coil the field coil the field winding is energized separately from a separate voltage source in order to create flux in the machine now self excited <coughs> self excited generators are those in which the field supply is given from the armature of the same generator that is it excites itself and that is called as self excited generator and the different types here are dc generators dc shunt generators dc series generator and dc compound generator now this is the picture or circuit of a shunt generator you can observe here the field winding is connected in parallel with the armature winding you can observe here this is the armature this is the shunt field winding the shunt field winding is parallel to the armature winding now whenever the arrangement is like this this is known as a shunt generator in case of a series generator the field winding is in series with the armature winding you can observe here the field winding here what you observe here the field winding is in series with the armature winding and such an arrangement is known as series generator compound generators have two field windings uh, windings namely rsh and rsc 
RSC, RSH means shunt field winding, RSC means series field winding. Compound generators is of two types, one is short shunt and another is long shunt. Short shunt means the shunt field is connected directly across the armature and long shunt means shunt field is connected across the armature after the series field. You can observe here, you can observe here. See this is short shunt, here you can observe this is the shunt field. Shunt field is wired parallel to the armature and afterwards you can see the series field winding which is connected to the load. Now, such an arrangement is known as short shunt compound generator. Here in this case, it is long shunt because you see this is the armature winding, this is the series winding and the shunt field winding is parallel to both the series field winding as well as the armature field winding. So, this is long shunt that is why it is called as long shunt. Here it is short shunt that is <coughs> it is only across the armature winding whereas here the series winding as well as the armature winding uh, across both is this shunt field winding is wired. So, this is called as long shunt winding. So, cumulative what do we may understand by the word cumulative compound generator? That means here the series field flux and the shunt field flux are so connected that it adds with each other that that is it adds with each other series field and shunt field are so connected that the series field adds to the shunt field flux. The both the fluxes add up with each other that is why it is called as cumulative. Cumulative means what adding ok. In differential compound generator the series field flux and the shunt field flux are so connected that it opposes each other that is difference there is a difference subtraction takes place here ok. <coughs> So, here you can observe here. Now, this is differential. Here you can observe the direction of the arrows here. The shunt field flux and the series field flux are in opposition to each other. They are in opposition to each other that is it is going to be a difference. Whereas, in case of cumulative shunt field and series field flux both of them are in the same direction. So, it adds up with each other it is a cumulative action. Next coming to the applications of DC shunt generators. Now, DC shunt generators have almost constant voltage from no load to full load. Therefore, these are used for applications which requires constant voltage for example, in electroplating, battery charging for excitation of alternators etcetera. DC series generators <coughs> the terminal voltage increases with the load current from no load to full load. Therefore, these are used as boosters, it is used to supply for arc lamps and it is used to provide excitation, excitation current in regenerative braking locomotives. Compound generators, differential compound generators are used to supply arc welding machines, level compounded generators are used for lighting and for power supply to offices, hostels, etc. And over compounded generators are used to compensate the voltage drop in feeders. And finally, coming to separately excited generators, these are used where the performance of self excited generators are unsatisfactory. So, it is used where a wide range of voltage is required in the laboratories for testing purposes and it is used for speed control of motors like as in Ward Leonard method of speed control. Thank you.